Welcome to Nightlight. I'm Barb DeLong, your host. I invite you to step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enter, <clears throat> as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide the beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. Nightlight, a reminder that we are never alone. Nightlight welcomes back Reverend Michael Carter, who is the author of Alien Scriptures, Extraterrestrials in the Holy Bible, A New World If You Can Take It, God, Extra Extraterrestrials, and the Evolution of Human Consciousness, The Metaphysics of Spiritual Healing and the Power of Affirmative Prayer, and... God Consciousness, A 30-Day Journey to Achieve God-Centered Thinking. Tonight we're going to talk about UFOs in the Bible and the influence that they have had on the awakening of the consciousness of humanity as well as the shift of focus for the new enlightened philosophies that go beyond traditional religions into the new paradigms that call to us from the future. Michael's written articles on UFOs and religion for such publications as the UFO Magazine, Alien Encounters, the MUFON UFO Journal, Contact Forum, the Space Newsletter, that's a UFO support group in New York City. And he's spoken at UFO conferences such as the Second Philadelphia Need to Know Conference, the annual Long Island UFO Conference with Bub Bud Hopkins, as well as appearing on radio and TV programs across the nation. He's also appeared on Japanese television discussing the Bible and UFOs as well. A longtime UFO experiencer, he lectures, is, he lectures extensively on the topic of religion and UFOs. He's appeared on the sci-fi channel Steven Spielberg's production of Abduction Diaries, the real 4400. And he's a frequent guest on the History Channel's production of Ancient Aliens. Well-traveled, well-written, well-spoken. Michael, thank you for coming back on Nightlight. I really am looking forward to tonight. Are you there, Michael? Did we lose Michael? Sean, did we use, lose him or is he muted? Can you hear me, Barb? I can hear you now. Did you kind of go off to another world for a while? No, I was here. I put my... A headphone in, but obviously something screwed up there, but it's okay. We're on now. All right. Well, I, I just did a lovely introduction. You can listen to it in the archive. <laughs> I heard it. I didn't know who you were talking about. Thank you. Uh, was definitely you. <laughs> was definitely you. Um, it's really kind of interesting because Michael and I um, uh, first met uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, he, a, a mutual friend introduced us, and he said that he thought that Michael would be a great interview for the show, and I agreed with him. And so we, he sent me some of Michael's work, and I, I when I read um, about Michael, I had to kind of chortle a lot. Uh, apparently, Michael and I uh, went to the same college, and uh, not only that, but one of the people that, that he acknowledged in his book was my my uh, my husband, uh, Patrick Cook. So we had a, a pretty good foundation from the very start, and he happens to live in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, and that's where my very best friend lives as well. So I am, you know, delighted that, that we made contact and connected, and even more delighted that he's been a prolific writer because when I recontacted him, uh, it turns out that he not only wrote the first book, he'd written three more since I had last spoken to him. So I'm, I'm very excited to get you back on so we can talk about the new work that you've been doing. 
Yes, it's it's been a journey that I can tell you. And let me say this to those listeners, Barbara, just um, for those of you who are listening, Barbara DeLong is a very gifted and talented uh, clairvoyant. And so I just want to put that out there. She gave me a wonderful reading uh, just a very few days ago. And um, it's really given me a lot of insight. So I just wanted to put that out there, Barbara. Well, I, I appreciate that, unsolicited. Um, but I will remind you that I was reading your energy. So if I did sound intelligent, I was probably drawing it from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was great. That's all I can tell you. A lot of fun, actually. Um, I, I think one of the things that... The, you know, told me that I was that we were going to be able to talk about stuff was when you had mentioned Patrick in the intro of your very first book, which yes, um, yes. and I, I have his book right here with me next to oh. me. <laughs> it's a great reference book, but yeah, just in case um, the reference for, book. for those of you, Patrick Cook um, did a lot of Bible UFO work. He was one of the um, the first people to start to draw the correlation between the Bible and and UFOs. And um, when he started out, he was definitely um, pegged as a, a real crackpot. And uh, at the end of a, a decade or so, he was heralded as, you know, a very innovative author who had insight and wisdom beyond his time. So um, must have been hard for him to live through those first couple of years, so I would imagine. But but um, it, his, his work and yours, was was finding that that there was there was such correlation within the Bible about UFOs and and um, and visitors or aliens. Which what term do you prefer? I know you said you didn't like extraterrestrial. Oh no, I don't mind or that. Alien, alien. I don't like aliens. I just say star people. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like a, like a lot of uh, First Nations, uh, a lot of Native Native American brothers and sisters refer to them as star people, and they're. Uh, uh, coming from star nations. But yeah, I just, um, no, extraterrestrials, listen, people call them worse, but aliens seem, seem such a, I don't know, it just seems. Well, when you call them an alien, you you, you immediately go back to the movie Alien and, and get the wrong feeling as to what we're talking about, I think. Yeah, and even when we call other human beings illegal aliens, it's, it's just... Uh, I think there's a better way to, 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 to refer to people. So anyway, that's, that's, where, that's where I am. Well, let me ask you something, because I, I know that my journey in the spiritual field literally started by seeing a UFO. That's what triggered, unlocked, um, blew open the portal. I don't know what you want to call it, but that's what opened me consciously and higher consciously to the fact that we are not alone. There are, there are worlds and universes out there and, and other entities that, that, that have consciousness as do we. And so what was it that, that was your trigger? Where, how, when did you suddenly get on this amazing journey that you're on right now? Oh, that's a great question. I, well, it starts on December 28th. Um, 1989, when I referred to in the book, my first uh, contact that I recall as seeing someone in my room, I mentioned coming back from the pyramids in Chichen Itza and Tulum. We were on the Yucatan, my girlfriend at the time. And when I got back to New York, I was living in Manhattan at the time. And uh, I had been invited to a party and I didn't want to go. But, you know, I wanted to kind of show off. I'd never really been out of the country. That may have been my first time. And, you know, it was 85, uh, 89, 90 degrees there. I was I was laying out in the sun. I had a beautiful tan. And so coming back to New York, it was below freezing. So I wanted to gloat. <laughs> my girlfriend, I said, look, I'm going to go downtown and come back. So I walked the subway down to Times Square, walked over towards the river, and um, – I got there fashionably late. I um, no no um, adult beverages were consumed. I think I may have had some deviled eggs, some potato salad. I stayed long enough to make an appearance, and um, and then went back home. And sometime during the night or the morning, actually, 
Uh, I don't know what woke me up. I don't think it was nature. Maybe I sensed uh, an energy in the room, but I sleep on my stomach. And I, I, I rolled over and my room was lit up um, like bright daylight. And there was a being at the end of my bed who was glowing, but also had this glow around him. And I'm using, I, I, it could have been a she, I, I'm using him. And uh, it was like this cobalt blue light, but it was also had this uh, great white light around it. It was, it, was, it was fantastic. And I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Um, my girlfriend at the time did not, or either could not wake up. And we just stared at each other. This being had the, a pear-shaped head, uh, was not gray, was more of a chalk white looking brother. And so, but very thin, maybe about three, four feet tall and had on this skin type uh, jumpsuit, if you will, that looked like it was made, it looked like it was made of Reynolds wrap. And I, I, probably have never been that frightened in all my life. And I've been in a couple of frightening situations. And so what I did was, macho man that I am, uh -huh. I, I pulled the covers up over my head. That would have been, my, that would have been my reaction. <laughs> it was going to go away. And so when I, when I did that, when I did that, I heard this whoosh. This swooshing sound, and I felt the temperature change, and I felt like I was outside. Now remember, this is the 15th floor of the Excelsior Hotel at West 81st Street between Columbus Avenue and Central Park. So when I pull the covers down, no one's there. Uh huh. It's like nothing ever happened. Yeah. And um, that's what triggered me. Uh, of course, there were there had been other contacts uh, off and on to this very day. But what had happened was because I already had a biblical background. Uh -huh. uh, I had gotten away from uh, the African American Baptist tradition of my youth, and at that time I was very much into metaphysics. You and I talked about religious science, unity. Uh, very much into metaphysics, um, reading tons of books on channeling and tarot. I mean, it just just opened. I was already open, and, and this really opened me up more, and uh, I think it accelerated my spiritual growth. So December 28, 1989 was uh, the time that really got me into it. Of course, I read everything I could on it, but I really started, what, what got me was the religious aspect. Um, and of course, the, the Danish Christian theologian uh, Soren Kierkegaard says life is lived forward, but it's only understood backwards. And so what had happened was I started thinking about times when I was a child and I would wake up with blood on my pillow thinking it was a nosebleed. Oh. Well, it was actually bleeding from the nose, but I didn't know where I thought maybe it was coming from my ears or something. Um, then finding out about implants and people having uh, waking up with blood on their pillow in the middle of the night or morning. I started remembering um, how I started seeing auras around everything. I thought everybody did. I mean, at a ver I, I don't remember not seeing them and starting to, to realize how my intuitive uh, capabilities became stronger after these contacts. Of course, I went to a psychiatrist uh, <laughs> after, that, uh, after that encounter in 1989. I feared for my sanity. And I was fortunate enough to have been regressed by uh, Bud Hopkins. Much, much later, we did a, a, a conference together, the late Bud Hopkins. Um, but also, uh, you know, just the whole journey of, of it changed my life. I mean, outside of the birth of my daughter, um, it's the greatest event that ever happened to me. Uh, I was first regressed by Dr. Jean Mundy. She too has gone on to life after life. Uh, but they gave me, especially Jean Mundy, because again, I was feeling for my, fearing for my sanity. Uh, she helped me put the pieces back together and that I was not crazy. 
uh, I was not psychotic, but I would have to make peace with uh, these events and to go on with my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's um, something that happens, and 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 I have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I I'm not saying this is the way it happens with everyone. So, you know, if if others haven't had this experience, doesn't mean you don't have a calling. It just means that that in my experience, I have found uh, a lot of the um, people that 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 I have met along the way here, and and my my experience was embarrassingly about 20 years earlier than yours. Um, it took me longer to get to where I was going though. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's almost as though there is a knowingness that you cannot deny yet you cannot explain or prove. And it, it, it changes your perspective of life and makes you, for want of a better word, unique. And, and if you can if you can work with that uniqueness, that's great. Otherwise, it is unsettling. And and I've not had um, the kind of visitations that you've had. And yet, on a different level, I've had that knowingness, that calling, that pulling that has um, actually ripped me from a 25-year career as a teacher um, into this field full time. And and it, it's almost as though there is. I call it a cosmic manipulation, and, and I don't. I, you know, I think I would like to believe that it's it's an outside source that's manipulating me. It may well just be the spirit within me trying to convince me this is a way to go, and I'm more comfortable with with saying it's a cosmic manipulation. But people who have these kind of experiences literally have no choice but to follow the calling even though we're not sure exactly what it's calling us to. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, what's the old, uh, it, it's based on the biblical, uh, many are called, but few are chosen. Of course, the miracle says many are called, but few choose to listen. Yes. <laughs> I, oh, be, being a chaplain, you know, listening to people's stories. I mean, it can be anything like this. It doesn't, it could be a divorce. It could be a, uh, an NDE, a near death experience, a death. Uh, you know, it could be any one of those things that kind oh, of yeah. throw cold water on us. I know at the time that this happened, I was living the life of Riley in New York. I mean, I was in a professional theater, um, life was one big party and I was very self-absorbed, which you have to be to a degree to be in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, but this opened me up and uh, I, I had a choice. Uh, the choice was to keep going on and, and being the party animal and um, going. And I'm not saying that, that the theater is wrong. I don't want to be clear here. I, I, I'm not saying that. But for me, it's interesting. As an actor, I was in the business of creating illusions and now as a healer and a metaphysician, I'm in the business of dispelling illusions. Um, and I use that theater training uh, whenever I'm speaking publicly. So you, you just never know where life's going to take you. But yeah, uh, I do feel called. I think we all are to a greater degree or lesser degree. I, um, I just try to maintain that the, my message for what it is is more important than me. Uh -huh. So, and because and, living in celebrity culture, it's one of the reasons I wrote the last two books on healing and God consciousness, because I was, you know, I just didn't want to be known as the UFO minister, even though that was a big uh, catalyst for me. But, um, you know, and living in celebrity culture, it's easy for person for the personality to be more celebrated than the message. So I just try to keep that in mind. Well, keeping one foot in both realities is probably the hardest thing for everyone to do. Um, when did you come to the point where, because um, I'm fascinated, I, I know you're, you were in a, a church, you were a minister, and and so when did you start to recognize or, or to be a, to to understand that the Bible was in many ways allegorical in many ways it was you know it, it was giving us a message very much like science fiction movies do today you know preparing us for a future that we weren't 
consciously ready for, but had to become consciously ready for. When did when did the the UFO and the Bible sort of um, merge together for you, so that you saw that the new meanings, the different meanings for everything that was in that book? Right after uh, right after the initial contact, um, I like I said, I read everything I could. At that time, I had gotten away from the Bible in the sense of, um, you know, the the dogma of it, if you will. Mm -hmm. But uh, but after I had that contact, I, uh, I I I I started searching, and I had, uh, standing on the shoulders of your late husband, standing on the shoulders of. Uh, Dr. Barry Downing, who wrote a book back in 1968, he's still a dear friend and colleague called UFOs in the Bible. Um, Dr. Vir uh, Reverend Virginia Brasington, we had some female energy uh, in the mix here, which is always welcome. She was from this part of the country, Asheville, North Carolina. She had written a book called UFOs in the Bible. Morris K. Jessup, who had died under mysterious circumstances, I believe in the late 50s, he had written a book about uh, the Bible and UFOs. And so when I saw these, it was like these, these publications, it was like water to a thirsty person because I had a reference point. Uh -huh. I, and I said, okay, there are other clergy. Uh, the only Morris K. Jessup was not a clergy person, but I, there were other clergy who were putting this together. And uh, I still hadn't come out. I was in the closet about my own personal experiences. My first publisher was Barbara DeBolt. She had a little mom and pop um, publishing company in Arizona. And she said to me, Michael, you really need to put your own experiences in there. And I was very much afraid because 20 years prior to this, you know, I, I presented my work as research, but I was afraid to come out and say, this has happened to me for good reason. I wanted to have a career. I've had some people at that time even say, uh, it's an interesting story, but please don't ever tell anybody that if you want to have a career as a professional clergy person. But as time goes on, fear lessened. And I'm very grateful. I went to Union Theological Seminary in New York, one of the top seminaries in the country, and they allowed me to write on this topic as my thesis in order to get out of there. And uh, kudos to them because I don't think many seminary. I think many seminaries would have said, "You're not going to get out of here. You're not going to graduate from here writing about that topic, young man." <laughs> and uh, so that, that really started. Um, started getting me going, and I, I appreciate the Bible. I I appreciate the Quran and 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 the the, the First Testament, and uh, I, I love it. Uh, um, and it gives me a new and I knew I know I knew more biblical uh, biblical language, Hebrew, and some Greek when I was in seminary. But if you don't use it, you lose it. It's a very different book if you know those languages. But it gave me a new appreciation. Um, but I started putting things together. Uh, Jesus, for instance, uh, uh, looking at angels in the Bible. I think that if you put the word uh, ET or star person everywhere you see angel, the Bible makes much more sense. Uh -huh. I started looking at, and we can talk about Jesus later. I started looking at Yahweh. I said, this is not, even though he does progress, um, from Exodus to, to later on, but he's he, this doesn't sound like a god to me. This sounds like an ET with anger management problems. <laughs> well, so, yeah, you you've opened a door here. Um, let's yeah, let's look at this because you got the Old Testament and the New Testament, yeah. and um, the God in each of them is is really. If you stand back and, 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 and first of all, before I even go any further, I totally respect anyone, everyone who who interprets the bible literally literally that's that's works for them and and the bible is an amazing book for wherever you are and it doesn't mean that you're lower evolved or more evolved it it, it means that that's where you are um has nothing to do with you know well i'm i'm more evolved because i see further or anything like that it's where you feel comfortably within yourself. That's what you should honor. That's what I would honor for you. Um, it, it, in, 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 in looking at the Bible differently from a different perspective with, with, 
great respect due to the people that have written the text that go in to com comprise it. Um, uh, lots of times they they were writing and, and they were utilizing their own frames of reference for that time frame for that period, 2000 and more years ago, so that they didn't have the technology, the understanding and, and the comfort zone with things that are a little bit unusual. So, so they describe things in their own words, using their own frame of reference, and perhaps, just perhaps, it would be different if, if, if we were describing what they saw. Is that fair? I, I think so. Uh, I would just go a step further for me personally. I have I, I love the Bible, I, and it's and we and you know we're going to disagree on stuff. I I am not um, um, as long. I, I, this is where I come from. We don't have to think alike to love love alike, and uh, I'm not going to force my belief on anybody else. And I don't want it forced on me. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay. That, All right. So so going back to the Old Testament and the New Testament, it does yeah. appear that God either had a personality change, deep therapy, or was two different personas. Yes, I mean, I, I believe that one could argue that the God of Jesus is different from the God of the First Testament in the sense of um, um, where they were on the evolutionary scale. Um, I What got me going was, for instance, now I'm, I'm looking at my Hebrew translation of the Bible, uh, which is the Tanakh. And I'm looking at Ezekiel 4, uh, verses 12 to 15. Yahweh is telling this to Ezekiel. He wants him to eat a barley cake that has human excrement on it. He says, eat it as a barley cake. Now, this is the original Hebrew. English translation, you shall bake it on he human excrement before their eyes. So said the Lord, shall the people of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations to which I will banish them. And then Ezekiel says, he says, then I said, but Lord God, my person was never defiled, nor have I eaten anything that died of itself or was torn by beasts from the, my youth until now, nor has foul flesh entered my mouth. In other words, I, I keep kosher. Uh -huh. Yahweh answered me, see, I allow you cow's dung instead of human excrement. Prepare your bread on that. And I'm reading that and I'm saying, well, what a guy. You don't have to eat it on human excrement. You can eat it uh, cow's dung instead. And I'm saying that doesn't sound like the God that I want to be in contact with. Does Does that mean that, that he meant on it or, or did he, could it mean that, that he meant bake it on a fire made from human or cow. We could interpret it anyway. I'm just reading from the Hebrew. But the point is to have another human being eat excrement in any way mm -hmm. is not advanced spiritual growth to my mind. No, no. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm just saying, you know, because we, we read these things or we're taught not to read them. And so or, or we're not supposed to ask any questions because that means we don't have faith. But, you know, my daughter would read that and say, Daddy, why why would Yahweh ask someone to do that? So that, that that's all I'm trying to do uh -huh. out. Um, uh, you know, there, there are other passages uh, where Yahweh is telling them, I'm looking now, about killing men, women, and children. Um, you know, telling them to go into the land that I will show you. But, you know, I, I guess this is why Native Americans, some don't have a problem with some of the Christianity, because there are already people there. Yeah. And if I'm giving you land, okay, where, where someone else is there, one could say, well, that's really not your land. Uh, looking at Jeremiah 13, again, the original Hebrew, English translation, uh, Chapter 13, verse 14. And I will, this is what the Lord is saying to Jeremiah. And I smash them against one another. Parents and children alike, declares the Lord. No pity, compassion, no mercy will stop me from destroying them. So, so is it 
your theory then that that the God of the Old Testament was a different star person, different? I would I would say so. The other thing I want to put out there though is this: many times in the First Testament, the Old Testament, these terms are used interchangeably, Lord and God or Yahweh, depending on what translation you're reading. So sometimes Lord could be the commander of a ship. Uh -huh. uh, God could be Yahweh. You, we don't know, but what we do know is that there is an entity who is telling folk how they should act, what they should do. Um, and and what's very what's what's very um, vital in all this is that we're, we're going to be uh, in in you know Passover is coming up. Is that there is no Jewish religion. And of course, if there's no Jewish religion, there's no Christian religion because uh, Christianity comes out of Judaism until the Exodus story, until uh, uh, Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt and crosses the Red Sea. That's when they become Jewish? Th th that's when there's a Jewish religion because that's when Yahweh gives them the commandments. That's when you go in the book of Leviticus and he tells them the dietary laws. Uh -huh. uh, that's when, um, if you go further into Leviticus, he talks about how much, how many shekels for slaves, and I'm and I'm wondering why would a God tell people what to charge for slaves? Uh, you could see where I would have a particular sensitivity to that, and yeah. it's, again, it's not to uh, uh, denigrate; it really, really isn't. But for those people who have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. A lot of people have given up on the Bible because of verses like that. And I think that if we put it in a context, maybe this is not the almighty intelligence uh, of the universe. Maybe this is a star person. That would make sense. And, and you know, of course, he did. whoever gave the commandments said that he was a jealous God, jealous God, and to not worship anyone but, other than him. Why would a God be jealous? I mean, if you're omnipotent and omniscient, uh, what do you have to be? What do you have to be jealous of? He's also very. Uh, this God is very, very obsessed with um, uh, the sexuality and the mating practices. The men have to be circumcised. Uh, you cannot mate with people who are not in the Hebrew tribe. Uh, he was very, very uh, concerned about that. Um, and so this person, this 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 individual has a very personality a very uh, a personality with flaws and insecurities and and power but then looking when we go to Isaiah for instance this is just another thing to recommend the, the ancient astronaut theory when we look at Isaiah 40 in the new revised standard version of the of the Bible um, we're looking at Isaiah 40 of verse 22 Isaiah says it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. How did Isaiah know that the earth was a sphere? Yeah. And looking down, it sounds like he's looking down from a great height. If he says they look like grasshoppers. And so here we have, uh, it gets one wondering um, because I was taught, maybe you were too, that, People thought the world was flat until Columbus, but here we have someone writing 5,000 years ago saying that it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Also, it, it, it possibly even has a little bit of um, suggestion that perhaps they were giants as well. Well, yes, the Bible does talk about that. We know about Goliath, who could have been a hybrid, but we knew there were giants on the earth in those days. Archaeologists are finding the remains of, of beings. And we also know that some of our star people uh, can range anywhere from three feet tall to seven, eight, nine feet tall. Well, isn't there also when when they send out uh, when they send out uh, scouts to take a look at the land of food and honey uh, of fruit and honey, they come back and they say they looked upon yes. us. I think it was as yes. grasshoppers. The same comparison. Yes. That's exactly exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so these were just some of the things that I looked at um, 
uh, looking at uh, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, wonderful job Gabriel has. Uh, he's also in the Quran, but er everywhere he goes, a woman gets pregnant. What the job he has, whether it's Elizabeth, whether it's uh, who's Mary's, uh, well, Miriam's uh, cousin, you know, John the Baptist, uh, Miriam's cousin. Yeah. Uh, whether it's, well, she doesn't even have a name, Samson's mother in Samuel. But again, um, uh, and, and of course, Miriam, uh, you know, everywhere they go, these women, Sarah, uh, everywhere you go. Yeah. No age limit either. I mean, from from some older women, uh, as Sarah was past, uh, we would call it menopause, but as, as it's phrased, past the age of having children. But, you know, when they go there, these women become pregnant. Uh -huh. uh, and so I started going, wow, that's very interesting. Um, and of course, angel meaning messenger in the Greek, you know, angelos. Uh, uh, so they don't necessarily have to have wings. I want to be clear because I remember saying that on one show and someone called in. Well, I know angels have wings because I've seen them. And I, I don't want to. Yeah, fine. That, no problem. <laughs> I just think that in the Bible, there's no mention of them having wings. Doesn't say they don't. Right. Yeah. And I'm looking at the theory that wings were put on just to let us know that these beings flew. And and they flew because they were star people. That they had, some of them had ships. Now there are people who travel interdimensionally that maybe not don't even need a ship. I want to put that out there too. The, the universe is teeming with life, but we are focusing on uh, uh, the people of the book. You know, Islam, Christianity, and um, and Judaism. So so there there that that's that's what I found so rich, and. Um, and, and for me, it does not take away, and I could be wrong, I mean, let's be honest, uh, but for me, it doesn't take away from the messages or the beauty of the book, but it does resonate with what you said earlier, that our ancient ancestors were using the nomenclature and the vocabulary of their time, mm -hmm. and they did not know how to describe this technology. And so these people would be godlike. If I went back to maybe 4 BCE, and I brought out my Apple phone. <laughs> uh, yes. And showing them a little razzmatazz, who knows? I could have started a religion, who knows? Well, so, um, uh, well, there, so I think all there, that comes into play. There's an old movie out there called They Must Be Gods, and are you familiar with it? No. Um, Oh, should, should it, in one place in the movie, this man is flying over um, uh, places in Africa that, that have, not, have not actually interacted with, with modern society as we know it. And he's eating lunch in the plane, and he, throw, he drinks a Coke, and he throws the Coke bottle out the window. And the, um, it, hits, it hits a native on the head. And the native is knocked out. He heard this noise. He looked up and this thing hit him on the head. And they worshipped the Coke bottle as a god. Oh, the gods must be crazy. That's the movie. Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, it's a great movie. I great. mean, and it, in, great. Patagonia, in Patagonia, they did it with the, the cargo ships. Yes, exactly. And I talk about that in my book a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so and and so you, you, you do begin to wonder... What we worship today, you know, is is just from our frame of reference, from you know whatever records we have, and yet it there I've I've been of the oh probably the last twenty years saying, okay, so this is what we've used, but it's it's ant it's antiquated. There has to be something that goes beyond this. Um, someone who was uh, very fun a, a fundamentalist said no after god wrote the bible he wasn't writing anymore and i thought it's in, it wasn't god it was inspired you know the the, the people they're there well in some cases they say that the that some of the books are compilations they aren't really written by a, a particular person and let's face it a lot of the disciples were illiterate so um you know they it, at the very least they dictated um so, so it's kind of, you know, you get to a point where, you know, where do we go from here? And, and I can't, 
it, 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 I, it is unfathomable for me to think that inspired reading stopped 2,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. And, and you know, but um, as you said earlier, you know, people are where they are. Mm -hmm. and, and if that works for them, I have people in my family who believe that and uh, they're good people. They they are hardworking, honest people. Um, I, I just see it differently. Well, everybody has their own personal truth inside of them. And and <clears throat> if they excuse me if 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 they see to expand it they do if they seek to to hold to the the dogma and whatever and if that's what gives them peace of mind and, and solace and and faith and comfort then that's where they should be um it, it, what what is right for one person is not right for the others and so exactly. you know it you just have to honor where everybody is and and I try not to to tell somebody they're wrong, I, I just, I like hearing the different philosophies because I take a little bit of everything and that, that creates my own personal, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my I center agree. that I go to. Um, one of the things that I do want to go into, um, and I really want to get into some of the, the um, material you had in the second book. The first book is, is, is really, is amazing. And, and of course you were talking, you were preaching to the choir with the first book because you know, I, most of the material I had heard before. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. But, but in a lot of ways I wasn't because I cannot tell you how many emails and stuff that I got. Oh, I'm sure you did. That, that, that people had never heard that before. And, and, this, and this is why shows like ancient aliens are, 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 are so, have caught on because whether we agree with everything or not, it's gotten people open to the, and who was it? Oscar Wilde who says that once a person's mind is stretched, it can never go back to its original shape. Oh, absolutely. So, um, there were a lot of people who, of course, there were people already privy to this, obviously, you being one of them, but there were many, many, many people who had just not even thought about that, were not, didn't even know that they could think in this way. Oh, yeah. And what I love about shows like this and, and Revolution Radio and Freedom Slips and, and dot com, what I love about this is that there is a freedom to put the philosophy out there. And, and all you're doing is seeding the universe with the possibility and the thought of, and everyone takes it and uses it as is most appropriate for them on their journeys. Yeah, and yeah. And yeah I, I agree. I agree. I agree with you. My church, people in my congregation, they never even thought this it, it's it was like uh again stretching the mind now that doesn't mean all of them agree and what have you <laughs> but they were just, um they were just i i was surprised at the uh, some of them had burst out of my own stereotype of my own congregation and some of them lived up to it but but it's okay but it was it was uh it was news and it gave people another way to look mm -hmm. at the universe and our place in it one of the other things especially in, in in your new book the the um a new world if you can take it god extraterrestrials and the evolution of human consciousness um one of the things that that snagged me right away was the um the Ghanaian uh the sankofa an expression in the Ghanaian yes. language yes I loved this, and and you want to you want to tell tell us what it is because I just it's such a wonderful I I, I almost want to needlepoint it and put it on the wall. Yes, yeah, Sankofa. Uh, <laughs> when I think about UFOs and religion, the word that word came to mind. It's an expression in the Ghanaian language of Akan. It literally translated Sankofa means it is not taboo to go back and fetch what you forgot. In other words, it means that we must go back to reclaim our past, or at least honor it, in order to move forward into the future. It's, again, uh, a variation on the theme where Kierkegaard says that life is lived forward, but it's only understood backwards. And the symbol of Sankofa is that of a large bird whose head is facing in the opposite direction of its body. Um, the bird is advancing, okay, 
but it is looking the neck from the neck and the, and the head it's looking backwards uh -huh. um, and this is the way to examine our past and 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 hopefully have a better future there's also an old african american saying that goes never forget the bridge that brought you over and so again it made me go back and look at the bible in a different way because it was the bridge uh and, and metaphorically that it brought us over as a people in many ways um and i'm just looking at it in a different way but i always have a love for uh, the written word and for the bible oh uh, yeah absolutely yeah yeah i really do and it, it you know the bible <clears throat> excuse me is a bridge to understanding to comprehension to reminding and and you know i when i read that i thought Wow, he's also talking about the element of reincarnation as well, that, that that which brought us to this point in time, that which bridged us through time, that that which carried us from the past into the present also helps us to create a foundation to build the bridge to the future. But we have to have all of the building blocks. You know, we can't just say that was the past, let's forget it and let's move on because if we forget the past, then, then you know, that old saying, you know, those who forget, well, it's about history. Those who don't, those who forget to remember history are forced to repeat it. Yeah, if you don't learn from it. Yeah, you will. And especially in our country now where we're going through uh, this revolution, if you will, um, it, it, you know, we, we have historical amnesia and, uh, and, and hopefully that that will change. It's not about obviously living in the past but we can learn from it and hopefully if we learn from it it can it can lead us to a brighter a brighter tomorrow oh absolutely and and in that way as well the the bible does give us um it, i i really feel strongly that that in many ways it's 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 giving us the hints that are so awesome that that to to hit us in the face with the reality would be more than most of us could bear but it's giving us hints as to what we can open to i mean look ezekiel's wheels he's ezekiel is 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 telling us about a spaceship yeah um uh i want to just be clear for people listeners out there the bible is not the only source of wisdom and uh and goodness and justice and mercy. We're just talking about that now. If you purchase the books, you'll see that I do go into the Quran and- um, Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, getting back to, to your point, Barbara. Yes, um, there's a wonderful book uh, called The Spaceships of Ezekiel, written by Joseph Bloomridge, who was a NASA, he's deceased. He was a NASA scientist. And what he did, he was an engineer actually, and he took the book of Ezekiel, word for word, and he designed what he thought Ezekiel saw. You can go online and look at it. It is copyrighted. Uh, you can also still get the book. It's called The Spaceships of Ezekiel. And, um, you know, it, it, what he saw looks just like a, a ship. And this is what Ezekiel may have been talking about using his vernacular of the day. And that's what we always have to keep in mind. They're describing the best they can, something that they've never seen before. Uh, we see it at the cloud uh, in, in Exodus, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. The Hebrews follow this for 40 years, wandering in the desert, we're told. We know that modern day UFO reports, we see that some ships are camouflaged by clouds. Some of them look like they're coming out of the clouds. So it's the pillar of cloud by day. At night, it glows like a pot, like a fire, the pillar of fire by night. So by the time we get back from, from, from the Exodus story, uh, we go through Ezekiel, where well, they're called flying chariots. Of course, uh, there are other uh, uh, um, wit witnesses in antiquity talking about a flying cloud, um, uh, a chariot, if you will. By the time we get to the time of Jesus, it's no longer the pillow of cloud by day, the pillow of fire, fire by night. It's called a cloud. Just like now, we no longer say unidentified flying object. We now we shorten it to UFO. Uh-huh. 
but they weren't dumb people. Well, Constantine they, saw flying shields. Yes, yes, and there are many examples in any in, in, of every age. And so, you know, they knew that people didn't fly on clouds. They know that. <laughs> they weren't stupid people, but that was what they, that's what, the, that was the best way they could describe it. Jesus leaves on a cloud. He says, I'm going to come back in the clouds of heaven. We don't have to d d debate the veracity of that verse, but he, he, he leaves in a cloud. Uh -huh. He comes back in a cloud. Uh, uh, we know um, that uh, uh, stars don't travel across the heavens. We know that. You want to talk about tsunamis and earthquakes. If a cloud traveled across the heavens, it would, I mean, the, gra the whole gravitational pull of the earth would uh -huh. be uh, disrupted. But we know ships do that. We know that uh, uh, lights don't shine down from um, clouds. We know that. Stars don't hover over mangers and start up again, but we know ships do. Oh yeah, when when the the ship that landed on my campus rose up and hovered for a short, brief moment over my dorm and then was gone, um, it went so fast, there had to have been a sonic boom, but there wasn't any. There was also no displacement of air. Yeah. Um, I mean, no way to explain yeah. logically what I saw, but there it was. Yeah. And so you say, so well now now I've jumped into the New Testament, but um, you know, hey, this man says that uh I'm I'm my father. My father is above and I'm below. Uh so if my mother's human and my daddy isn't, that means I'm not fully human. And this can be thought of as Jesus being a hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Makes his, perfect sense. Yeah. His mother is human. His uh -huh. daddy isn't. Joseph is his stepfather, if you will, his earthly father. Uh, so when he, he says that this is my father, that's literal. Uh, when he's on trial in John before Pilate and he says, I am from above and you are from below, that's literal. Uh -huh. That's literal. And so it, it puts the ministry of Jesus in a very, very different light. Does not take away from his love ethic. Does not take away uh, uh, from his healings or uh, the so-called miracles. But it does say that perhaps this brother was sent here from another dimension, another world, to try to show us a better way to live. Yeah, the message is what's really important. And, oh. um, and and quite often, you know, we need to have a spectacular delivery in order to pay attention to the message. And that's what we got. Um, we're, we're coming up on a break, so I don't want to hop into something new. But um, and, and, and the music is going to start. And I just I got the two minute warning. So I, I'm, I'm really stalling here for the music to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but you're right. The the message is what's really important. It doesn't it doesn't matter where it came from. Truth is truth. Yeah. And and, and you know it it it, it resonates. It rec and the truth is usually very simple. The more complicated people make it, the more everybody has put their two cents in. It's it's like passing a bill through Congress. Everybody has to put their little itty bitty bit in until it becomes you know four thousand pages and nobody knows what the bill says. Yeah. But but the message from Jesus, from Buddha, from all of the master teachers out there is simple. It's, it's not complicated. It's, it's an easy truth. And if you apply it to your life, magic happens. And that, that's my word, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's there. It's there. If you can get past all the noise and distractions. And again, that's why I, I had written those other two books um, because, I mean, I love talking about my experiences and all that, but um, it's it's about the consciousness shift that, that occurred. Oh, yeah. And, and I do, you know, in our second hour, I want to get into 
um, your experiences, uh, the visitors that you have met and talked to, and and the message that they bring and share as well, and um, and how similar it all is to the Billy Meyer material, which I happen to love getting into. <laughs> yes, I, I I do not blame you for that. It's wonderful. It's, it is. Um, it is fascinating. Okay, we got about Michael. Um, this is this is where I've been leading up to. Um, I, you have had an experience similar to Billy Meyer, and Billy Meyer is an amazing man who has produced a um, a body of work that is possibly the most impressive one as far as being. Um, a contactee of, of, of star children or star people. Um, and and his, his story is profoundly fascinating. For those of you who are not familiar with the Billy Meyer material, please Google Billy Meyer and read up on it. It's fascinating material. I, I, as with everything, you know, I, I, I don't swallow it whole, but um, a majority of the material is fascinating. It's articulate, and Billy Meyer was a, is a very simple man, uh, and he goes into everything from string theory to um, multiple dimensions to you name it. And and he is he started having contacts um, with the star people when he was very very young, and it has continued to this day. Um, and you have had a similar experience, which I find fascinating. And so could you share that with us? Because it's yeah. profound. <laughs> yeah, well, well where, my, where I think my story parallels with um, uh, uh, Brother Meyer, and, and, and definitely I stand on his shoulders as well, is that um, having the contact with the Nordic-looking uh star people, the, uh, some people call them Palladians or Nordics, uh, and that's where my healing occurred. I use a lot of Billy's or Palladian philosophy in the book, in one of the chapters on Palladian spirituality, because I think it resonates. Now, uh, in answer to your question, I have had the, the experience of meeting um, three different races. Um, we would call the first brother, I guess we would call him a gray or a, a zeta reticula, reticular lion or what have you um, from that star system. I don't know if that's where it's from, but his phenotype, one would say that. Like I said, he was not gray. He was kind of chalk white. And we do know there are different species of grays, different races of grays. Um, I have had contact with reptilians that were very frightening only in the sense of, again, being able to walk through a wall in my bedroom in the middle of the night uh, and having that look. I mean, they were beautiful in hindsight. Um, the eyes were yellow with the pupils going um, vertical, like a cat does at times. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Uh, but I wasn't thinking they were so beautiful when it, he came through my wall. And then... Of course, the most recent, and that being in the last few years, and the healing that took place was from a Nordic individual. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, you've, you've, that I signed a contract this lifetime. I mean, I was told through a psychic who kind of channeled them, who did not know I had these experiences, actually, because I wouldn't tell them um, that I did, in fact, um, have other lifetimes with them as an earth person and um, that I signed up for, uh, if you will, a spiritual contract to do what I'm doing now. It's one of the reasons that I am here. Mm -hmm. um, that does resonate with me on a very, very deep level. Um, but I am fascinated with these blonde, blue-eyed people because in our culture, we have been spoon fed but now maybe force fed that all of these star people have to look like the grays or have to look like they just have to look so bizarre and in some places some of people say ugly and they really don't um there is a movement going on with paulo harris 
and a brother by the name of Gerard Austin. You may know him. He's a good friend of mine. He lives in Amsterdam. And what they're doing is Timothy Good is in that bunch, another wonderful UFO researcher, who they are now, and it's good to be open to what's going on in Europe. You know, we can get isolated over here in the West. But what they're doing is they are really promoting the more human look, the encounters with more human, not humanoid so much, but human looking extraterrestrials. And I think that's very, very important. I think that the powers that be want us to look have this xenophobic kind of attitude that they all have to look weird or bizarre to us. But I think they're very threatened. Uh, that, you know, some of these beings can get on an elevator with you, and not unless you could pick up the energy, you wouldn't even know. And that means they could be in places of power in governments. They could be working at your post office, but also it lessens the fear factor. And I think that rather than have the populace lessen their fear, we want to push that fear out there more, and that these people are the other. Uh, case in point, do we really need a part two of Independence Day? <laughs> Will Smith and the aliens were the bad people. And do we really need that? And yet the Hollywood is making a uh, part two to this with uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum is in it again. I mean, we have uh, what's the other one? Fallen Skies, where they're the you know, they're the bad people and Earth has to band together. And I'm not saying that all star people want to sing Kumbaya and hold hands with us, but neither do all Earth people. And so just as there are benevolent and malevolent Earth people, there are malevolent and benevolent star people. And we need to kind of get that, that nobody's all good or all bad. We've been taught to think in these polarities. Now, I did resist. Um, on an intellectual level, the star people, being the diversity trainer that I am, being the anti-racism trainer that I am, uh, most of my friends in Europe, they were like, well, the contacts they had were mostly with the Nordics. And over here, we were being force fed the grays. Uh -huh. um, and I was a little uptight about that because what I was hearing in the UFO community, consciously and unconsciously, was that the blonde blue eyes were... They're, they're the nice ones. They're the beautiful ones. They're the angelic ones. And the gray or reptilian or dark skinned extraterrestrials were, you know, we have to watch them. They, they, you have to watch these people. They're not like. And so I started to see this dichotomy. And I'm like, man, we do that with each other. Uh -huh. And, and, I, and I, I resisted that. Um, and sometimes I would call people on it. So what are you saying? that all Nordics, because in the in the Billy Meyer cosmology, all there 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 there's a there's a, a malevolent set of Nordics and there's a benevolent set of Nordics. So, you know, again, you know, it's not just one or the other. I, all I can say is the healing of my blood clot on July fourth, twenty thirteen at nine fifty PM, uh it was from a Nordic uh looking individual. Well then um, so you've had you've had contact with these three groups. Um, are is is information shared, or is it just a matter of becoming familiar with the fact that these are star people? The information that was shared was usually shared um, through pictures. Uh -huh. For instance, uh, I was shown a past life um, by one group of extraterrestrials. Um, I was out of town and had a visit at a bed and breakfast one evening. I was there doing in Boston several years ago. Um, and I was shown a picture of a, a pair of hands in prayer. And the voice said, look. And there was a thunderbolt between the palms of the prayer hands. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I'm a healer. I use that logo on my business card now. And for me, that was uh, them pushing me, use your healing ability, use it, look, use your prayer and healing ability. There were times at the beginning when I was shown, um, for instance, at one time um, I was paralyzed and a needle was stuck in the back of my head, right at the base of my the neck where that little hollow is, where your 
the brain stem and the thing. Anyway, and it was extremely painful. And I talked to a friend of mine about it. And she said, you know, you have to put some boundaries around these folk. And you have to tell them they may or may not listen that that hurt. And you got to, you know, we got to have a little more equity in our communications here. And at first I scoffed at it. But in my prayers and meditations a couple of nights after, I put that out there that, you know, come on, man. And so about a week later, I, I was paralyzed. I could, I, And they were in the room. And they showed me a picture of a syringe. And I felt just like it was painless, this little prick in my crown chakra. Now, I later found out that that you, you can reach the pituitary gland in many ways and uh, but you can, one ways you can get it is going through the back of the skull uh -huh. and um all i can say is that my 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 intuitive ability skyrocketed after that but what i was more impressed with was that they listened to me uh there have been times when they've just appeared in my room and held my hand uh, what 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 had changed was at the beginning I would be paralyzed, and I don't know whether that was for their safety or mine. Maybe they thought I would get up and throw something. I don't know. <laughs> the fear factor was really extremely high for many many years, and even to this day, I still at times go to sleep at the last minute with the light on. But what I did was I used that fear because my the fear wasn't from them. Because they've done nothing really to hurt me, at least purposely. If anything, my my spiritual growth was accelerated. But I but what it did was it made me say to myself, Michael, this fear of the unknown, this fear of them. Because at the same time I feared them, at the same time I missed them when they didn't show up. Uh -huh. um, and they used to show up pretty frequently at the beginning. The point I want to make is just that. I took that fear and I said, Michael, where else in your life does fear get in the way of you living? And so I, I'm not saying everybody should do that. I'm not, I don't want to shit all over people. And I know people who have had horrific experiences where sperm and ovum were taken forcibly, where there were anal probes, and that's very real. So I want to be clear, it's not all kumbaya, but for me, my experience was not as traumatic, at least to me, and I used it as a lesson. Well, it, it also it also expanded consciousness, and and I think that yes, yes. no no question. What what, what I mean no. by, when I say I used it as a lesson to look at your fear is an uh -huh. consciousness. Well, it also gives you, um, I think, in in many for for me, it, it would also sort of validate the fact that that you know there is more than just exactly what we know as far as indigenous to this planet there are um entities that can come energies that can come and go there we are capable of so much more if if we allow ourselves to go there and it doesn't mean we go crazy it doesn't it doesn't mean that we're we're nuts it just means that that we have inside of us greater power than we know, and and it, my philosophy is that that they they come to remind us of what we've forgotten, and and what we can become yet again, and it doesn't have to take thousands and thousands of years. I mean, it probably will, knowing the human psyche as I do, but but uh, it, it it's sort of opening ourselves up to even reanimating those strands of DNA that, that are not activated that, that we have within us. And, and, and you know, it's not garbage. It, it, it's DNA that does something and we don't know what it does uh, of, the, of, the, of the 24 pairs. We only use one pair. The rest of them are just there. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't, you know, science doesn't know what, what it is, but it seems to me that visitations like you have seem to be waking you up to greater potential that you carry within. I don't think in any way it, it feels to me as though you're guided as opposed to, you know, being pushed. No, no question. And and that's why I say my experiences on the whole have been positive. In short, they've what they've done is just, and I always knew this even coming into the planet, but I always knew that love was really the glue 
that held it all together, that love is really the most powerful um, uh, force, energy in the universe. And I, I don't I don't really believe in evil because of my belief in reincarnation, but it just, I, I use the words of Dr. King. Um, he says that uh, he had come to believe that even good temporarily defeated was still more powerful than so-called evil triumphant. And so that, that, that always stuck with me. They also, um, you know, and part of this wisdom I had come with with other lifetimes, they just made me live it more. Um, uh, I think I talked to you about my famous, my favorite Rumi quotes, that the first one is that um, out beyond ideas of right and wrong, there's a field. I'll meet you there. <laughs> and the other one is when I was young and clever, I wanted to change the world. But now that I'm older, I realize I just need to change myself. Yes. And, they, and they made me really realize, Michael, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be at peace? And I say all that to say, Barbara, that I don't, and this is for Michael, I'm not saying, I don't worry about other people so much about that. I just try to say my evolution is what I'm responsible for. And that there are young souls, there are, I was a younger soul, uh, you know, there everybody's not going to evolve at the same rate. There's some people who have to learn this lifetime that power and money and sex are not all there is to life. And that takes several lifetimes to learn. And so there are people who are there. There are people who are going to be where I am. There are people who are going to be above and below. And so I just try to let people be, because I know so many people, especially activists, they get bitter because they, why isn't the world like this? Why can't people see? Why, why, why? And it's like people are on their path. Uh -huh. I just have to be on mine. You know, and, 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 and I don't get upset about things. People get upset about Trump or they get upset about Putin. Or, yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean I don't reach out to help, but I'm kind of detached from it now. I've been around so many lifetimes that I'm getting to see life for the beautiful journey that it is, but also the gaminess of it and what's worth getting upset about because it's all the illusion anyway. Um, and that's been my shift in consciousness. Well, it, it's profound. And, and I think the other thing that, that um, I was so fascinated with, with, with your book is, is, of course, the spirituality of the Pleiadians and, and how um, they have the Talmud of um, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, yes. Yes, uh, beautiful book. Beautiful book. Um, you want to explain a little bit about um, what that is? Because uh, most people... Um, probably haven't heard of it. Yes, I'm looking as I'm talking to you because I thought I had it. Ah, let me pull it out here. Okay. The Talmud of Emmanuel is a Palladian version, if you will, uh -huh. in Aramaic. Some And some parts of it were lost. It was given to Billy, Billy Meyer uh, got his hands on it. Um, it is the Palladian story of the birth of Jesus. And um, it is taken, it is supposed to be the original copy of the book of Matthew, if you will. Okay. And what is particularly, and it's called the Talmud of Gemmanuel. And they're spelling Emmanuel J. M-M-A-N-U-E-L, they're saying that that was the original name of Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus is the Greek translation of Yeshua, uh -huh. or, or, or some would even say Joshua. But according to the Palladians, and this is, there, there, there is some, um, there's some things that, that would give credence to what the Palladians are saying. Uh, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, we have this verse. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh -huh. 
And in Matthew chapter 123, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And, and it makes you wonder, how did we get Jesus from Emmanuel? Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, Emmanuel means the one with godly knowledge, and I'm mispronouncing it. It is pronounced Emmanuel, even with the J. Um, there was, as the story goes, there was a gentleman by the name of Rashid who was later assassinated uh, trying to get this information out. Uh, yes. This would be do great damage to Christianity as we know it, and he was killed along with his family um, somewhere in uh, Lebanon. And so uh, I'm jumping all over the place, but you can, uh, um, one can Google the Talmud of Germanuel. You can also purchase it. I have two copies of each. There's an, a companion book called Celestial Teachings. And it is uh, the Gospel of Matthew. However, it says that uh, Gabriel was Jesus's father, that Jesus did survive or Germanuel did survive the crucifixion, went to India um, with his mother Mary, uh, and he was married to Mary Magdalene, lived to be the right at the ripe old age of 120 degree, 120 years young. However, that he was in contact with uh, extraterrestrials through his whole ministry. So it's a very different slant of the Gospel of Matthew. There's a companion book that goes with it called The Celestial Teachings, and it is the book of Matthew, word for word, and right next to it is the translation of the Talmud of Germanuel. And you get to see, you get to decide uh, what makes sense to you. For instance, Matthew 5, 3 says, this is from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Talmud of Germanuel, chapter 5, verse 3 says, Blessed are those who are rich in spirit and recognize the truth, for life is theirs. Which one sounds, resonates more deeply? Uh -huh. And uh, it's a fascinating book. We, the scholars will not touch it for obvious reasons because careers can be broken maybe made but broken but it, it is heretical but it goes into the birth of, of Germanuel that his father is a guardian angel um he's he's all through his ministry he is in contact with extraterrestrials and billy meyer was given this material um and where was it discovered uh it was discovered in i believe in lebanon well, I know that's where uh, Rashid lost his life. Let me I, look. I know that, that according to the Billy Meyer material, that, and, and I'm not an expert on it, I just have... Um, it, it was in near Jerusalem, it says here. Okay. It says, Meyer says that Rashid was led to an ancient tomb site in or near Jerusalem, very vague, where um, he, he was digging, he was led to dig, and he said that the tomb was the site of uh, of, of that of, where, of Joseph Arimathea, where Jesus was buried. Uh -huh. And in 1963, Rashid took Meyer to the tomb on two separate occasions, according to this. Again, Rashid lost his life. He and his family were in a refugee camp. Allegedly, Billy Meyer said that Israeli intelligence had gotten wind of uh, the, the, the scrolls and um, Rashid was assassinated. Yes. Um, it, and, and the rest of, you know, the book, you know, ha, you know, has been destroyed. Um, a lot of, a lot of these were, a lot of the scrolls were destroyed. What, as you said, want the, want the audience to hear that. And it's translated from, uh, the Aramaic, you know, Jesus spoke Aramaic, not uh, King James English, as people sometimes forget. The point being, though, is that you can still purchase these. And if it is a hoax, it's the person who did it 
must have been a genius because it's really uh, detailed and elaborate. But it is the Gospel of Matthew from the Palladian perspective. Now, now, Palladian spirituality goes goes into into the fact that that there is one, there is a creator, there is. Um, it, they don't talk about God; they talk about a creator. Is that accurate? Actually, they do talk about God, and they talk about God in uh, the Talmud. What they say and what uh, Emmanuel is saying is that there is a God, but that God is an extraterrestrial and is all-knowing and what have you. Above that God is creation. And one of the things that, uh, which is an energy, but it is called creation and intelligence. And one of the things that Emmanuel slash Jesus was was very furious about is that people were being taught that God, who he calls the God of the human races, was creation. And he was saying that, no, no, you, you, you're missing the point. Yes, there is God, who is a, a humanoid extraterrestrial, uh, who has part of creating human beings. But above all of that, the supreme, omnipotent, omniscient being is called creation. So they do say that there is a God, but it would be God with a small g. Gotcha. Yeah. They also talk about um, uh, the good, how can I say, uh, that, that in the very beginning there were some Palladians that were from Lyra. And so actually they were called Lyrans. It gets a little confusing. You have to read the book. But that there were a benevolent set of 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 these people and then there was a set who were very power hungry and what have you makes me think of nazi germany who uh allegedly had contact with the blonde blue-eyed race this is where hitler gets his master race yeah the aryans uh, yeah and so it makes one wonder if hitler was in touch with the less evolved nordic uh kind of folk very fascinating um the the other thing that, that, and I know I'm hopping all over here, but there were so many things that I found just absolutely fascinating that I wanted to pull out and, and just throw out there. So that I want to talk about <clears throat> the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, we did a show on that on Ancient Aliens. The Ark of the Covenant um, was what ancient astronaut theorists are, are talking about. And I'm one of those is that this was actually a communication device to co communicate with Yahweh. And uh, it was made of gold, which we know gold is a good conduit for energy, copper, uh, and that people actually lost their lives, um, you know, carrying it around. There's some biblical verses that, that, that talk about this. Hold on, let me see if I can find some. But in the meantime, um, and the priest had to dress in a certain way. If you know the priest, the Hebrew priest, they had to wear a breastplate with all these crystals and jewels in them. They had to uh, wear a long gown. They had to wear headgear. And it's been, um, it's been thought that maybe this was to keep them from uh, being contaminated by the radiation. Now, they also used the umen and the thurman. Which was, uh, some scholars say, which was a force of, div uh, a way of divination to contact Yahweh, to get readings, if you will. Mm -hmm. The psychic would, yes, indeed. So that, so that, so that in, I know that there, there, uh, Patrick talked about um, somebody using the description of the Ark of the Covenant um, as a project and, and also trying recreating it so that it would receive signals and and apparently they were able to reconstruct it and and it was a receptor it, it, yeah it, yeah because you know what 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 was what it was used for i mean with gold and copper i mean these are things that entered that that you can use you know they help channel energy and so um i think that it was now but it was also hazardous uh, because there were people who touched it. And of course, they thought that uh, Yahweh was angry with them. And why not? Uh, Yahweh stays angry a lot in the Old Testament. <laughs> yes, but, it does. Uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely angry. But it was probably from 
um, the radiation and being electrocuted. A lot yeah, of they, people, yeah. They they talked about uh, and and the the illnesses and the sicknesses that often um, came from being in close proximity. Uh, appear to be very similar to radiation poisoning exactly and that's and that's i think that's another reason why the priest had to prepare uh and and put on the breastplate and they had these uh um the clothes they had to wear i think it was very elaborate and i think it was to keep them from uh the radiation now did they not also call the ark the seat of the most high or the seat of well, they thought God resided in it. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a mercy seat. If you go into Exodus 25, verse 22, Yahweh says, I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which were angels. So it was, it was more or less a holographic um, projection of some sort? I believe it was. We don't know, but it makes the sense. This technology was literally out of this world. And, you know, it says in uh, uh, Exodus 16, too, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to your brother Aaron that he come not at all times into the holy place so that he will not die. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So it's probably a hologram there. That, yeah, that's what it sounded like to me. And then, and then and, you go. Yeah, you know, we're talking about auditory and visual communication. Right. And and then then you go to things like you know Old Testament still, but Sodom and Gomorrah appeared to be uh, nuclear explosions. People are saying that it it does seem to be that way. I think there are people who uh, scholars and archaeologists have said that there's still glass there uh, from the blast. That some of the sand is still glass there in some areas in, in that part of the world. Um, and so it seems like it, it really could have been uh, nuclear weapons there. So, so especially in the Old Testament, um, where where the God was not as benevolent as He becomes in the New Testament. How, just out of curiosity, because I honestly I don't know if I knew and forgot or if I never. What is the time frame um, year wise between the Old and the New Testament? Oh, I don't know exactly, but you're talking several thousand years. Okay, that's, that's what I think. Maybe five, eight thousand years. Okay, so 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 there is a period of time where apparently there are no written records of, theoretically. I well, you know, there 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 are probably written records, but there are no there's no this is what a lot of fundamentalists and evangelicals have a problem with. There's no original versions of any New Testament documents. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're none. Uh, but what we can say is that um, th these beings were still visiting the earth. If you go and look at, now, that doesn't mean they weren't written in other, in Sumerian, uh -huh. as Bias Stitchin talks about, um, or in other, you know, Akkadian or Assyrian. Uh, uh, but there's there's still contact. I mean, Jesus is still having contact uh, with Gabriel still coming to visit. Uh, Gabriel's in, in the Quran, so he gets around. He's visiting Muhammad 600 years after uh, uh, the birth of Jesus. So, you know, these beings are still... Um, oh, oh, yeah, and look at, look at the, um, the Vedas. Um, you know, you have the flying the flying machines in, in the, the Vedas. Vedas. The Vimanas and, yeah. and the Upanishads and the story about them in the Mahabharata, which are uh, even thousands of years before uh, any oh. of this stuff is being written down for the Hebrew people. No, I, I, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to, to sort of wrap myself around is that, that we have tens of thousands, maybe millions of years um, of, with con this, of contact. Yeah, of contact that, that, that are actually literally still here on the planet if people pay attention to it. Yes. 
Well, you know, listen, it's happening. I mean, disclosure is happening all around us. We have all astronauts, the late Edgar Mitchell. We have many uh, civilian airline pilots and people are coming up now and they're saying, you know, I've seen this stuff. I've seen these crafts. So it's happening all around us. Some people are waiting for a president to come out on the White House lawn and announce it. That may or may not happen. But when you look at Brazil and Mexico and France and Australia and England and China, they've released much of their classified information about UFOs. Only the United States is still sticking to the story that they don't exist. And we're not interested in them. But disclosure is happening as we speak. Well, and not only that, but but the consciousness of all of humanity is expanding so that at this point the United States can deny all they want, but they kind of look foolish um, in contrast to the rest of the world. But, but uh, you know, my, my, my feeling here is that, that we are going through a time where where we are, you know, it's, it's of course they're there. And, and I... I don't know that we're going to come to a time where, you know, they are so integrated into our society that, that you know, we, we just take them for granted. I, I, it makes one wonder, sort of, why are they here? Well, according to ancient texts, they're here because they created us. Okay. Uh, uh, not all of them. I mean, we, we can never know what, because there's so many races, you have to say, well, who are you talking about? But many of them have a hand in our creation. And so it's maybe they come back to see how we are faring. Uh, a lot of these uh, visits occurred right after we split the atom over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That gets people's attention when your neighbor down the street is playing with guns. Yes. And so that also is another reason. Uh, well, could be another reason. There are so probably some people here to exploit us. Um, uh, so there are many reasons uh, because there are many different um, species who either come here. Some people may be here just to observe. Uh, some people may be here just to say, you know what, they, they're making the same mistake we made. <laughs> uh, uh, but they just don't get it. So it's 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 it's. I think it's as many reasons as there are species, or as, as there are races. Well, we've had we've had many. Um, well, we've had many individuals <clears throat> here on the planet that that were, whether they were hybrid or not, they were certainly inspired teachers, and and I do feel that that there has been a tremendous amount of message being given to us as a, as a species uh, th that has come from many different sources, many different directions. The, the you know, the, the source is love, you know, to love one another, to take care of one another. Um, and, and whether it comes from a wise man or Gandhi or Buddha or Krishna or or whoever, there there is a an overlying message that keeps coming at us over and over and over and over again, and it just it and it's simple truth. It's not complicated. If you do this, then this, or anything like that, it's it's the element of allowing love to expand your consciousness, your heart, and and to create a brotherhood again that we had at one time and apparently lost through, I don't, I don't know, um, too much TV, whatever. But, but it, it does feel as though we are, tr they are trying to, many of them trying to guide us back to a pathway that perhaps we have stepped off of. I, I would, I would, I would concur with that. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and, um, and, you know, human evolution is slow, as you've said many times during this, this broadcast. Yeah, you know, that we are evolving and it is all about our consciousness. And it is all about us being to, able to accept those that are where they are, um, and which is the most difficult thing. Uh, because you're not going to get 8 billion people to all, you know, uh, have a eureka aha moment at the same time. Um, but there are enough people it seems that we keep going, that we, we, we raise the vibration. And, uh, and I pass that on to my daughter 
and she raises the vibration and maybe her kids do or if she however her path is this time around and the world changes a little bit at a time well now i, I want to kind of go back a little yeah i know wouldn't you like to see it happen overnight though no that's what i was saying before i trust i just um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just trying to walk my journey and I, because see, the other thing for me is that I want to control. See, I want everybody to see it my way. See, I got it and I, and you got to get it. And I'm just trying to say, Hey, I'm just trying to, I, I can't even get my life together half the time. So I'm just trying to focus on that. But by doing that, I'm the example and that's right. all I'm called to be. That's all we're all, uh, well, that's all I'm called to be. I'm responsible for my journey. Well, and that's that's something that 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 I think is one of the basic lessons that they're all trying to teach us, that they're all trying to share with us, is that that we are responsible for ourselves, that that we are the creator of our realities, we are the creator of everything that touches us within our lifetime, and that assuming that responsibility and and making changes in accordance with what is a better way is our responsibility and and it isn't my responsibility to tell you what you should do with your life it's that i should do what's right with my life and and i think from from what from what you've spoken from what i gathered from the book is that that's an underlying um cause this it's something that is, is they're trying to teach us or, or no, no, that's part of Palladian, uh, that's part of Palladian spirituality, but it's not just Palladian. I mean, this is just how the universe works. Uh -huh. And this is why, you know, you have some, you know, the prime directive in Star Trek where we cannot interfere in another world's business because they have to have free choice and evolve. Well, that well, on, on that's on a collective level. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. It may be, at least with some races. But that's also on a micro level. I'm, I, I'm trying. The best thing I can do, like Rumi says, is change myself. Right. Change myself. Not worry about you know if so and so wants to smoke. Uh, 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 my ex-wife smokes cigarettes, and I, it's it's a trite example and. I used to get really upset. She doesn't smoke around our daughter and what have you. But after a while, I had to get it that, hey, she's a bright woman. It says on the side of the pack what it can do to you. But this is what she chooses to do. So what do I do? I have to change my reaction to it. But I can't change her. That's why the 12 steps are such a powerful spirituality. Give me the serenity and the wisdom. <laughs> change the things I can. And to, you know, to know the difference. And so if you take that on a, on a grander level, yeah. You know, because trying to change other people only leads to heartbreak and to ulcers and to hemorrhoids. <laughs> you, you, can, you, can, you can suggest something to somebody else, and if they don't, if they, and then it's up to them. Oh, but, absolutely. Yeah, but, but if you're going to try and change people, man. You know, that's 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 hell on earth because you can't do that. And you're only responsible for your own journey, not someone else's. I I know, and it, it makes it complicated when um, some some religions have become large corporate structures trying to um, shove everybody into the the consciousness, the way of life that they feel they can control and and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We, we are not um, mirror images one of another. Now, our spirits are amazing. But the, in, in the human reality, this is what we need to deal with. Yeah, and people, you know, have to find out that it doesn't work. Not because we told them, because they have to experience it. And that's where the spiritual growth of other people come into play. Because it's really so easy to say, I got these answers, and if you only did it my way, it would be okay. But on a level, we're controlling. You can suggest. You can say, this is what I found out. Uh, uh, who talks about it a lot? Um, Neil Donald Walsh. I forget which book, but it's so, it's so simple, but it's difficult that ours is not a better way. 
it's a different way. Uh -huh. And so, you know, it's like, you know, you, you, you find a pearl of great price in the parable that Yeshua talks about. And uh, you, you sell everything to find, you know, because you found it. But the other part of that story is you found it for you. Uh -huh. You got to let other people be where they are, because that's what becomes acceptance, not tolerance, but uh -huh. acceptance. And sometimes we have to accept things we don't agree with. Sometimes we have to accept things we don't like in other people and give them the freedom to make the mistakes that they have to make. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but you know, it, it's kind of, I, I, I often say to people, we're, we're all, um, I visualize the life, lifetimes um, as, as a river that, that is flowing to a source of all creation. And we all have a one person kayak and we can paddle our own way and, and go with the flow or whatever as we're guided. But if we try to paddle for another person, chances are we're gonna um, capsize both kayaks and have to go back and buy a new kayak and start again at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what they call codependency. I mean, if you, you know, when you're on a plane, right? You get on a plane and what do they tell you? You know, if you need oxygen, put yours on first uh -huh. before you start trying to tell someone else how to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just real simple, man. Take care of your own thing. We'll be okay. And again, that doesn't mean that you don't help or you don't at least try to help, but you got to find that line where you let people have the freedom to be who they are, even if you don't agree with it. Well, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, it's not so, easy, but it's, 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 it can be done, and it's a shift. It's just a shift, because then you realize that life is about trusting, and things are, there's a wonderful line in the Course of Miracles, and it's a meditation, and it just says, just for right now, let all things be exactly as they are. Right. A long time ago, I people were saying, asking me, you know, I, I was getting constant questions about how do I get on a spiritual pathway? How do I do this? How do I? And I said, just be. You know, yeah. don't just be. Yeah. And 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 it, it's 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 simple. And, and that's I think one of the, the the greatest challenges in this field is to explain to people how simple it is. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's like the Zen cone. First of all, we're in the West and we've been taught to be human doings as opposed to human beings. So it, it sounds simple to the Western mind. I mean, when you read the Zen cone, just don't, don't, don't just do something, stand there. That may be simple if you're born in the East, but in the West, we are taught rightly or wrongly, that you have to be doing. You have to have the glorification of busy. You have to be doing all the time. And so once we can we can look at that with compassion because we're, we, we were taught that. And sometimes it's harder to unlearn something than it is to learn something new. And so when yeah, I used to do that. Oh, man, don't you just get it? Well, it took me a while to get it, too. But people are taught that. We are taught that. And if I was born in the East, I probably have gotten it a little more sooner. But for the Western mind, to not be doing is a very foreign and difficult concept to grasp. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, now, you've, you've come a long way the last couple of years, that's for sure. Yeah. Yes, I have. You have absolutely... Um, and some of that was just life. All of it wasn't like some kind of mystical woo-woo. I learned patience and not being able to control when I was separated and later divorced my wife. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you know, I, I can't control her behavior. And so I also learned that you can love someone, but that doesn't mean, you know, everything's going to be... It's okay on one level, but, you know, that doesn't mean that everything's going to be happily ever after. But those those were just living a life, whether I had contact with other world off world intelligences or not, that's part of a life lesson. And what yes. I want people to hear is that you don't have to have people from another dimension visit you for you to learn these lessons. 
You can just, you know, start your path. Read up on things outside of the box, on prayer or meditation, on Eastern uh, maybe philosophy, on con Christian contemplation, whatever it is, you can do that on your own. Oh, absolutely. It, yes. It's it's something that, that is open to all of us. Yes, yes, yes. And as you said, you know, and, and I've, you know, for me, the message is more important than the experience to the fact that my message is what your message is. It's not sexy, it's old, but that we are more than we can be, that we are not separated from our source and God, the force, Allah, Brahman, whatever you want to call it, is inside of us. Yeah, and and, 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 and to teach only love because that is what we are. Yeah, and I phrase it, I don't know if, if I said it or if I found it someplace and I've repeated it, but it's the, the, the new age is as old as time. Yeah, there's nothing. We're, we're rediscovering it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is ancient. You've referred to it as ancient wisdom. And I, I just want to say this before we go. I want people to buy those books. You can go on Amazon and, and Barnes and Nobles and just type in Reverend Michael J.S. Carter and uh, those books will come up. And uh, you can email me at michaeljscarter at gmail.com if you choose or you can uh, blog me at michaeljscarter.com. But please, um, you know, study more. Don't take our word for it. Pick up the books um, and uh, and start the journey now. It's never too late. Oh, absolutely. And it's so exciting. And and the, the more you open to it, the more you find there is to, to, to rediscover and reawaken within yourself and to um, and, and I, I really, it's, it's such an exciting journey. It puts more vitality in your life and more vibrancy in your energy. Um, yeah. and, that, and I'm not saying sit and study like crazy all the time. Read some, absorb it, apply it to your life or not, and then read some more. Don't, it's an exciting journey. And, and you know, don't feel you have to push or struggle because the only struggle there is in wrapping your arms around new truths. And that's fun. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Absolutely. Take care now. Good night. Good night, Good everybody. Night.